right, here we are again. Good morning, everybody, and uh, nice to see you here. And welcome to those that are watching uh, this video. I hope somebody's watching. That would be really good. Um, thank you for that. So we are going to continue on our study of the Gospels. We are up to, um, and we're doing a chronological study, so we're finding each little bit that's taken place. We're finding there's tremendous, tremendous amount of information for us uh, in any of the events of the Gospels, and especially around the cross and the resurrection. So we're just going to continue on with that. Now we're in Luke chapter 23 today, and we want to do two verses in Luke before we jump back to Matthew. We're trying to pick out uh, uh, as much information as possible. So, um, yeah. Let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll get going. Father, we just want to thank you for your grace now, Lord. We just want to thank you for the, the songs, the hymns that we can sing, and the spiritual songs, and these children's songs. And Lord, we just want to thank you, and uh, we just ask your blessing upon us as we look at these portions of Scripture to do with the death, burial, and resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ. So, Lord, we thank you now, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, <clears throat> just do a bit of a review. Last week we looked at Joseph of Arimathea and the ministry that Joseph of Arimathea had. And he had a, a short ministry. Um, the Lord had, um, if I say called him to that, he probably did. He knew what he was going to do at the time. It was needed for um, a new um, uh, sepulcher, a new tomb, and he had that made and, and he, he had the Lord uh, placed there and the Bible does tell us that in Isaiah that the Lord Jesus it says he made his grave with the wicked and the rich and he was uh, there in a, a rich man's cave so we saw that we saw the two individuals of Joseph of Arimathea and we saw Nebuchadnezzar um, I mentioned last week I wasn't sure I'd forgotten about the, the fact that um, uh, Joseph had uh, his own tomb and tells us in Matthew 27 uh, 60 Jesus was buried in Joseph's new tomb and embalmed with the spices and Joseph's own new tomb it says in Matthew 27 60 somebody reminded me about that afterwards and I had just gapped it I guess and uh, anyways but regarding these two guys now you have these two individuals we are told about Joseph that he um, he was a, a disciple of the Lord Jesus but in secret because he feared the Jews, eh? and he was a member of the Sanhedrin. And Nicodemus was a guy that went to Jesus by night, or at night. Why was that? Same reason, just to keep it quiet. He wanted to uh, meet with the Lord and such. Now, the disciples who had been with the Lord Jesus for the last three and a half years, or whatever the time period was, was something like that, uh, who had openly followed the Lord Jesus as his disciples, ran away at the end. Okay. But Joseph and, and, and uh, Nicodemus, they're the ones who show up to see that the Lord has a proper burial in front of everybody and show their uh, discipleship in front of everybody. Okay. It's kind of interesting to think of that. The disciples themselves ran away, and these two guys who wouldn't even speak up for the Lord, they're doing something uh, um, that everybody can see. Uh, some things we just could uh, take out of that. Some people are like Nicodemus and Joseph, and they don't speak up for the Lord. They don't say anything. Uh, you may, uh, maybe at your workplace or something, there should would be a Christian person that uh, um, they don't tell you about the Lord, or they don't speak up or whatever. Or maybe that's ourselves, and sometimes we don't speak up. But what we can take out of that, though, is also that not to judge others for what they do, and don't judge people for what they don't do. For maybe in the end, you're going to be the one running away and somebody else is going to be doing something for the Lord. You just don't know. So leave that uh, uh, alone, eh? But there's no excuse for running away or hiding or anything like that. Lord, help us not to run away and not to hide. Amen. But we see that about these two individuals there. Um, let's get going here. Luke, uh, what did I say, 23, and we're down to verse 55. We want to look at verse 55 and 56, and we're going to back up to, um, to uh, um, Matthew. In verse 55 of Luke 23, 
23, we read, And the women also which came with him from Galilee followed after and beheld the sepulcher and how his body was laid. Now it tells us in Mark 15, 47, and if you make sure you have pencil and paper and stuff to write things down so you can check it out yourself. Mark 15, 47, it said that it was Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joses, were looking on him to see uh, where they had laid the Lord uh, uh, Jesus. Now, um, we read in Math Matthew 13, 55, there's a verse that says, Is this not the carpenter's son, and is not the, his mother called Mary, and his brethren, James and Joses, and Simon and Judas? So there's that Joses again. So this is the mother of the Lord Jesus Christ, and with uh, Mary Magdalene coming along, and it says they were standing against, they were standing across out of the way a bit, watching to see where he was uh, uh, laid, where the tomb was, and all that <clears throat> kind of thing. <clears throat> Excuse me. And they returned, verse 56, and prepared spices and ointments and rested the Sabbath day according to the commandment. Now you'll find many times through this, this whole thing, is, the Bible stresses one of those three days. It always stressing just those three days. Those three days. There's not four. There's not five. It's three days. There's preparation day. There's the Sabbath day and the day he rose. Okay, but um, they returned prepared spices. But Nicodemus already brought a hundred pounds of myrrh and aloes for embalming and stuff. And the ladies are going to bring more. So they would in a situation like this, you can imagine there's a lot of spices and such. And I guess for the embalming and uh, and just to because it's a good thing to do. I'm not so familiar with uh, their custom there, but maybe it's akin to us bringing flowers and things like that. The spices would have that aromatic uh, uh, odors and stuff about them. Okay. Now I want you to um, keep that in mind, and then we're just we're just going, going along chronologically and trying to pick up as much information as we can. Let's go back to Matthew 27 and have a look at a couple things here. Matthew chapter 27. And we're going to go at, uh, start, pick this up at verse 60. Matthew 27, verse 60. Well, we get back up to 59, we'll do that. We've already covered this, but we'll just do that. Uh, it's Matthew 27, verse 59. And when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out of the rock, and rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher and departed. He walked away. Now get it. Just get this. Now these are disciples of the Lord Jesus. They knew him personally. They had spent time with him and such. And now they have to bury him and then walk away. Now, I was thinking about this. It's the hardest thing to do. The funerals are bad enough, but there's a point at the, at the grave site where you have to walk away. You're gone. If you've never experienced that, you don't know what I'm talking about, but, and that's good if you don't have to, but it's a terrible thing to have to walk away. And they would walk away, and there's a lot of emotion there, I suppose. And that was the end of the ministry of Joseph of Arimathea, as far as I can tell. You don't hear any more about him or Nicodemus. They did their part. And they saw that the Lord Jesus had that proper burial, according to Scripture, as Isaiah says. And then they departed. They just had to leave. I found that very sad. I found a lot of emotions there. Uh, very hard thing. Put yourself there. And through that whole thing. There you have the body, and they had to put the spices in and wrap them up and everything. They knew him personally. They spent time with him. This is the Lord, and now he's gone. Verse 61, and, and there was Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. Well, we already said that Matt, Mark 15, 16 says this is the mother of Jesus, because it's Joses, is one of the brethren. Okay? That's, uh, that's the two Marys there. Sitting over against the sepulchre means not leaning against it. They meant over back opposite it, watching to see what was going on and where he was and all that kind of thing because they wanted to know that. It says, now the next day that followed the day of preparation. There it is again, the Lord's telling us, okay, 
What was the day of preparation? That was the day he was crucified. And then what's the next day? Well, that would be the Saturday. It would have to be because there's only three days mentioned, okay? The day of preparation is day one. The next day is day two, which was the Sabbath. But I wondered about this. The chief priests and Pharisees came together unto Pilate. And at first I was thinking, well, that's kind of hypocritical of them to go inside, go into Pilate's place on the, Sab on the Sabbath, and uh, they're not supposed to do that, go into a Gentile uh, home and all that, because they'd be uh, um, uh, um, defiled. But as we read earlier, when they went to Pilate to have, they wanted to have Jesus crucified, they wouldn't go in, they called him out, and that's probably what happened. They called him out and he came out to them, okay? So they called Pilate out in verse 63. <clears throat> saying, uh, Sir, we remember that that deceiver said, while he was yet alive, after three days I will rise again. Let's just look and see some of the words in here. See that word, Sir, right there. Now, as far as I understand it, looking it up and everything, as far as I can see, this is comes from the word Sire, is a word that was used for somebody who was very high, like a king, for instance, they would say, call him Sire. Okay, and we have that Sir today, which is a very uh, respectful thing if people every once in a while call all you sir, you know. Uh, I think where that's where that comes from. But the word that was used here is the word kurios, which is Lord. And they're saying to uh, Pilate, now they're not necessarily calling him the Lord, but meaning that he lorded over them. Over them. This is the, the, the government position. He was the governor and they were local government, okay? which is different. But I just thought it was interesting that the word Lord is there. They had to say, Lord, we remember. Now, just stop for a minute. They remembered that the Lord Jesus said that he was going to be raised on the third day. And yet at his trial, they had people saying one of the accusations against the Lord Jesus was that he said that he would destroy this temple and in three days raise it up again. He's going to destroy the temple. And they didn't know that he was talking about uh, the temple of his body. It just seems strange that they would bring that up like that. But the point being here, uh, the point we want to make is that these guys, the enemies of the Lord Jesus, remembered that he said it mm -hmm. where the disciples didn't remember it. Isn't that odd? How could that be? We remember that this deceiver said, now that word deceiver right there means exactly that. Um, to deceive, it means to forsake um, the right path. It means to go off the path. Well, they thought the right path was their religion, didn't they? And they were calling Jesus a deceiver. But way down in verse uh, 64, in case I forget, at the end, uh, he's risen from the dead. So the last error, see that word error there at the very end of 64, is exactly the same word. It's a deception. So they're calling it the that the, uh, if they say that they took away the body, this is another deception. So they're saying it's all about deception. It's causing the people to go away onto another path. And the Bible says about Jesus Christ, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That word way means that the pathway. I am the pathway to everlasting life. These guys were not. They were not. But that's what it is to be deceived by the enemy, by the devil, to have your doctrine and stuff to be something other than biblical. You will think that you're on the right path. Okay, I remember before I was saved, I thought I was just fine. I was kind of sitting on the fence. I'm not like one of them, those sinners that do all those terrible, horrible things. And I wasn't like those religious people that go to church all the time. I'm just sitting here minding my own business. The Lord says, you're on the wrong path. He didn't use those words, but when I got saved that night, it was like the veil lifted. It was like, oh, I am on the wrong path. Lord, save me. Forgive me and save me. But that's what they're saying right here. Now, they said, Sir, to Pilate, we remember that, that deceiver. What a thing to call the Lord Jesus Christ a deceiver. Eh? Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing that people will say something like that, and people say worse things today. And they use the Lord Jesus' name as a cuss word, as an expression of disgust or whatever. They said, while he was yet alive, after three days, I will rise again. They remembered this. The disciples didn't remember it. Okay? He says, command therefore that the sepulcher, that's the tomb, you know that, be made sure, means to be secured 
until the third day. Until the third day, not the fourth day. Until the third day, okay? The third day. Remember last week we looked at how the Jews and the, the uh, practice of them, uh, they would count even a portion of a day as a full day, okay? That's why you have that on the third day. And we saw the example in... Uh, uh, Esther uh, chapter 4, I think it was, about, that was an example there. And there was another example in 1 Samuel chapter 20. Um, so, the, so the last error shall be worse than the first. Well, they said, we want the sepulcher uh, uh, made sure, secure it, lest the disciples come by night and take the body away. Okay? They thought, we, we, have to make, we have to put some kind of a seal there and unless these, these sneaky guys are going to come along and steal the body and say, see, he rose and risen from the dead. But look what he says, they say here. And steal him away and say unto the people, he's risen from the dead. That was their, their concern, was that the people had stopped listening to them and they were listening to the Lord Jesus Christ in all his teachings and such, and they were very jealous. Not only that, it would affect their, uh, the economy of the whole thing. Uh, they're not probably not making their money. The people are following the Lord now, eh? And they're upset about that. They don't want the people. They want the people under their wing, and that's what it's like with any false religion today. You have the uh, the leaders and such. They're very zealous about the people just to keep them um, for one reason or another. Not concerned about their salvation, or else they would uh, uh, look into the the scriptures and such and find out, you know, they would really be serious about wanting to know what salvation is. But anyways, let's get on with this. That the last error should be worse than the first. They don't want, want there to be more deception upon the people. When they were bringing such deception, it's unbelievable. Um, verse 65, Pilate said unto them, ye have a watch. Now it doesn't mean this on your wrist, of course. We get our English word custody or custodian from that word right there. Okay, it means a guard. If you were to do something wrong, you get arrested, you'll be put in custody. And they will be a custodian, somebody watching, or you'll be in a jail or whatever. You'll be, and that's what they're saying. They want want somebody. They want you to to place uh, the the uh, tomb under custody, under a watch, under a guard to make sure nobody can tamper with the tomb. Okay. So mankind is going to put a seal on the tomb of the Lord Jesus. Let's see what happens. You know what happens, but let's look and see what it says here. Verse 66. Wait a minute. Okay. Uh, so they went and made the sepulcher sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. Now, what we're talking about here, and we're going through it, and it happens, and we go over it very quickly, the most important thing that's ever happened in the history of the world, the most important thing in the whole universe, is the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Without the resurrection, we're up the creek without a paddle, aren't we? It has to happen. Okay, This is the most important thing. The resurrection of Christ. And we're going to see something really marvelous here in a minute. Something I'd never seen myself. Doesn't mean anything. But uh, this, is a, this is fascinating, Lord. We'll get to that in a minute. Uh, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. The most important factor of Him offering up Himself. Okay? Without Him, we have, without the resurrection of Christ, we have nothing. And... The references for that, if you read 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 to 8, and you read that later, we're not going to get into it. He talks about some of you say there is no resurrection, and he gives some reasons why, what would happen, and so on and so forth. But now Christ is risen. He talks about the gospel and then uh, and the rest of it. So check that out. Actually, 1 Corinthians first, chapter 15, verses 1 to 22 is what you want to read. Okay? You want to familiarize yourself with that stuff. So they went, verse 66, and made the sepulcher sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. Now we want to just talk about that sealing the stone for a minute. I, just, I mentioned it just briefly. Man's seal. 
I don't know, did they put wax on it or something? I, I'm not sure, I don't know. It was a huge, huge stone, probably took several, uh, several men. I mean, I don't think Matt could even lift that stone. Uh, <laughs> huge, big stone to cover up. Uh, you just think about it, how big was the doorway? I don't know, it says, they had to bend down a bit to get in, because it tells us one place where, I think it was Peter, bent down and looked in. Okay, so even if it was, say, that high and like that, to cover that up, you'd need a stone like that, eh? That's a few hundred pounds more than that. That's probably as much as your car or something, you know. So it's going to take a lot to, and you've read some sometimes when the, the rich ones and stuff would have a big round stone and be in kind of a trough, and they'd take the little break out of there, the little rock that was holding it, and kind of roll down into place. Perhaps, perhaps that's how it was. A huge, huge stone, and they're going to, man's going to seal it. The sealing of the tomb by the Pharisees and the chief priests, okay? Well, we're going to see it broken uh, just shortly here, but uh, we'll get to that in a minute. We're going to talk about sealing. Uh, That's what all man can do. He can just do, do so much. Isn't it a wonderful thing when we look at the word uh, seal? Um, the Bible says in Ephesians 4.30 that we are sealed unto the day of redemption, not by man, but by God. And what are we sealed with? Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13 tells us that when you believe, when you trust in Jesus Christ, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit who is the um, down payment. He's the earnest of our salvation. The earnest means like a down payment of our salvation. It means you're sealed. Who can break that seal? Nobody. Nobody's going to break it. If you're out there and, you, and somebody's told you in some church or somewhere, somewhere along the line, some, some doctrine has told you that you can lose your salvation. If you are truly born again, if you've truly been saved, you've truly repented of your sins, you believed in Jesus Christ with all your heart, knowing who He is, what He's done, Lord, save my soul, the Spirit of God comes in there, and you're saved. He's not going anywhere. If He goes somewhere, you're going with Him. Your Spirit's going with Him. Because when you die, your spirit goes up and with the Holy Spirit, eh? You can't be separated. It's impossible. This is God's seal, all right? Very important. Anyway, we talk about man's seal versus God's seal. Then we get on to something else here. Um, get into something. I found this just fascinating myself. I hope you do too. I hope I can convey it to you. We're going to get down into chapter 28 and just look at um, a couple verses here. In the end of the Sabbath, there we go. He's showing us, he's walking us through preparation day, the day, next day, it's, it's the Sabbath. And now he's talking about the uh, end of the Sabbath and it's beginning to dawn towards the first day. That'd be our Sunday. Okay, so we did all that last week and the week before. So uh, in the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, this is the Sunday, the third day, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, that's, that's the mother of Jesus, to the sepulcher. Now here's what we want to look at in verse 2. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. Well, let's look at that just for a minute. Two things we want to look at. The earthquakes, first of all. Now, so we have here, there was an earthquake two days earlier on Friday, when the Lord Jesus was on the cross, remember it went dark and everything, there was an earthquake, and the rocks were rent and stuff like that, it tells us that, or was it referring to this one? I think it's two separate earthquakes, because this one right here is called a great earthquake, and the other one's not called that, and this one has a different, something else is going here, uh, going on here, and we'll see what that is in a minute. There's two earthquakes, the first ones, and the earth was shaken, this is back in chapter 27, verses 51 to 53. And the rocks were rent, and the tombs were opened, and many bodies of the saints uh, that fell asleep arose, and having gone forth out of the tombs after his arising, they entered into the holy city, and so on and so forth, and they appeared to many. Okay? But we're looking at the second uh, uh, quake. If we're reading this properly, and if this is what happens, I think it was two separate earthquakes. Okay? This one is called a great earthquake. There's mega. I mean, that's huge. A mega earthquake. Okay. And we want to look at uh, this one. The tombs were open. And, uh, where are we at? I forgot. Oh, this one. The angel of the Lord descended from heaven and he sat on the stone. Moved it and sat on it. We want to see who that is. Let's have a look at him for a minute. We look at the angel of the Lord. Okay. 
We're going to look at a couple uh, incidences in the Old Testament that talks about the angel of the Lord. Okay? And just bear with me. I'm real excited about it. I've never seen this before in my life. I, I've maybe have seen it, but you know, sometimes you read your Bible and you just kind of go over things. Yeah, I know what that is, but you go on. Let's just stop in a minute and go back into the scriptures and look at the, the angel of the Lord. You know the word angel means messenger. Like you read in Revelation chapter 1, or no, uh, uh, verse, no, chapter 2 and 3, the seven letters to the seven churches are written to the angel of the church. Is there an angel over the church? No, the word angel means messenger. Who is the messenger? That's the preacher. That's the guy preaching. He's a messenger. Okay? That's, the, that's what he's talking about. So there's a messenger here. Uh, let's see who this is. Well, you tell me if what I'm going to tell you is correct. And we'll see if, if, see if we can uh, um, discern from Scripture. You can turn in your Bibles or you can just listen, whichever you want to do. We're going to go to Genesis chapter 18. You might want to write these down at the very least so you can check it out later. Uh, we're going to look at the angel of the Lord. This is what is called the special form in which God manifests himself to man. What? Well, let's have a look. Genesis chapter 18. So the account here in uh, Genesis chapter 18, we see um, the Lord is appearing to Abraham in that dealings about uh, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay, in this chapter we want to look at, it says in verse 1, And the Lord appeared unto him, unto Abraham. Okay? Over in verse 13 it says, And the Lord said. And verse 17, And the Lord said. And verse 20, And the Lord said. Verse 26, And the Lord said. And on and on and on it goes. So what we read, go back to verse 2, Abraham lifts up his eyes and looked, and there was three men stood by him. And one of them was the Lord. Okay? Because it says, he saw, th there's three men there, and the Lord said, the Lord was there. Well, did the Lord just speak from heaven? Doesn't say that. It mentions three guys, okay? I just, just want you to, to see that, because what we have at the tomb of the Lord Jesus Christ, you have in Matthew says there was the angel of the Lord. Mark says there was an angel. Luke says there was two men. Two men. Keep that in mind. So the only thing I want you to, to look at here for uh, Genesis 18 is to see that there were these three men that approached um, Abraham. And if you read through that, you'll see the conversation. Abraham is having a conversation with one of those guys. It's the Lord himself. Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Jehovah or Yahweh, whichever one of those you want to use, the, the names of for the Lord, okay? Um, well, we're in Genesis. Keep that in mind that there was the Lord and the other guys were angels, okay? Or some form of angel. Over in Genesis uh, chapter 22, we'll go over there just for a minute. This is when Abraham was offering up Isaac, okay? Abraham's offering up Isaac. And we read that... Um, I have too much stuff here. I can't hold it all together. And you know that he was about to uh, offer Isaac on the, uh, the altar that he had made there. And um, in verse 11, And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. And he said, Lay not thy hand upon the lad, uh, neither do, uh, do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God. Who is I? I know the angel of the Lord that thou fearest God. This indicates to us that this is the Lord, okay? That this is the Lord God. Because down in verse 14 also we see in Abraham called him the name of that place Jehovah Jireh. Okay? That's because the, the Lord spoke to him. He said, and he's called the angel of the Lord there in verse 11. Not convinced yet? Okay, let's go over to Exodus chapter 3. And we'll look at something in Exodus chapter 3. Moses and the burning bush. And you know the account. You've probably memorized it. You've read it so many times. Now, use your sanctified imagination. Put yourself back there. You're, you're Moses. You're standing there. There's a bush over there, and it's burning. 
and then there's something strange about it. He goes over to see this sight, okay? And in Exodus chapter 3, look at verse 2. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. The angel of the Lord's in the fire in that bush. Okay? And Moses said, verse 3, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. Verse 4, and when the Lord saw, and when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush. Well, who did it tell us was in the midst of the bush? In the beginning. It's the angel of the Lord. Okay? Verse 6, he says, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, and Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look upon God and the Lord said verse 7 verse 14 and God said unto Moses I am that I am okay there's no mistaking who this is but the first read right, the first it says the angel of the Lord called up to him from the bush okay all right appeared to him and said the angel of the Lord is uh, the Lord himself uh, I wanted to show you another one Go over to Judges. I know we're going through these really quickly, but you can, hopefully you're writing them down. You can look at it yourself a little slower later. That's kind of how we're doing things here. We're going to go over to Judges. Right here. Judges 13, not 16. Judges 13. Let me change that. Okay. <clears throat> In Judges 13, this is about um, uh, Samson. Before Samson was born, uh, there was a conversation with Samson from the Lord, okay, uh, or with, with the parents, uh, Manoah and his wife, okay, before Samson was born. And let's look and see what's going on here. That's Judges chapter 13, um, verse 2, there was a man whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and bare not. And verse 3, and the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman, okay. The angel of the Lord appeared unto Manoah's wife and told, told her some things about this child that was going to be born that they're going to have. Verse 6, the woman came and told her husband, saying, A man of God came unto me, and his countenance was like the countenance of an angel of God, very terrible. But I asked him uh, not whence he was, neither told me he, his name. So Manoah, verse 8, entreated the Lord and said, Let the man of God which did speak to my wife, you know, come and teach us again. Come do that again. Verse 9, God hearkened unto the voice of Manoah, and the angel of God came unto the woman as he sat in the field, and so on and so forth. And verse 11, And Manoah arose and went after his wife and came to the man and said to him, Art thou the man that spake unto the woman? And he said, What? What was his reply? I am. Now you don't find any holy angels or anybody else using that title for themselves other than one person, God himself. Anybody uses that for themselves, that's blasphemy. That's no angel saying, I am. That's not put there like that for just to say, oh, this is who I am. He says, I am. Just like he said to Moses. He says, how shall I, what shall I call you? I am. Okay. Verse 15, and Manoah said unto the angel of the Lord, Verse 16, and the angel of the Lord said unto Manoah. And verse 17, and Manoah said unto the angel of the Lord. Now look at verse 18. And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Why askest thou thus after my name, seeing it is secret? Now that's an interesting word right there. Uh, this is a, a, a pretty uh, interesting study itself. The angel of the Lord, uh, he says that my name is secret. Well, that's interesting because when you look it up, I have a book of Wilson's Old Testament uh, studies where you can look at the Hebrew, every word in the Hebrew, and the word secret. He says um, it, uh, it means uh, wonderful. Where have you heard that before? Isaiah 9, 6, talking about the Lord Jesus. And he shall be called wonderful. Counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Wonderful is the same word as secret. His name is, they're speaking to Manoah. He says, my name is secret. My name is wonderful. These are titles of God himself. Okay? 
Okay. Now, if you can follow that, and like I said, we go through it very quickly. I'm sorry about that, but uh, you're supposed to check these things out yourself afterwards, anyways, aren't you? So we'll, let's go back to uh, Matthew chapter 28. I personally had never looked at it this way. I read this I don't know how many times, but I never looked at this. When you think, think about the uh, tomb of the Lord Jesus Christ, you think, well, okay, there's angels there. And that, that stands to reason. Way back when Abraham was going to offer up Isaac, it wasn't just an angel that was there, it was God himself, because it was an important event. Okay? And when for Samson was going to be born, God himself met with the parents. All right? And at the burning bush, God himself called the angel of the Lord. He met with Moses. It was important. And now here we have the most important thing in the history of anything in the whole universe is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And who's there? The angel of the Lord. Now, in some Bibles, I looked up a few different things, and some say an angel of the Lord. The word an is not in the text as the Spirit of God gave it. Okay? It is not. Okay? And behold, we're going to verse 2 of Matthew 28. And behold, there was a great earthquake. See that word for? That word for means just to describe. It means this thing that's happening now is because of what just happened. Kind of like that, eh? It was a great earthquake because the angel of the Lord that's God Almighty, descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. And that guy right there, and I shouldn't say it like that because this is the Lord God himself. Some people say, well, I don't believe that. Uh, it doesn't matter if you believe it or not. It's in Scripture. It's in those few uh, um, portions we just looked at, and it's in a lot more than that. It's the messenger of the Lord. This one is a title of a, a, some call it a pre-incarnate visit or whatever you want to call it. It's a God in a man's form as he appeared to Abraham before the burning of Sodom and Gomorrah. God was there. He's the angel of the Lord. The angel, God himself, comes down and moves that stone and the seal of man doesn't mean anything, does it? No. And he sat on it. But Luke, the, the account of Luke tells us there was two men. So there's another angel with them. Okay. I believe with all my heart that the angel of the Lord is God himself, is Jehovah of the Old Testament, that's Yahweh, that's the Father, however you, however you want to put that, that's who this is. Because you can go back in your Old Testament and you can see that the angel of the Lord, the burning bush says, he was in the burning bush, what the Lord just kind of nudged the angel, get out of here. Then he started speaking. No, that's not how we get it. There was, he was he appeared and he began to speak to Moses. It's the angel of the Lord. Say, well, well, big deal. You can say, yeah, this is a big deal, all right. It's a big deal because sometimes we don't follow things through. We just read that. Okay, see the word angel. Okay, that's all it is. That's not what it is. How can we take something out of this for ourselves? Well, we look at all the important things that have happened. Some hugely big things and events that have happened through biblical history. I mean, Abraham offering up Isaac, Moses at the burning bush, um, the parents of Samson, and God's there. We have something even better than that. The Christian has something even better than that. God is right in there always with you because this is an important event when you get saved eh? in God's eyes this is a tremendous tremendous thing you become one of his children and he's there with you he will always be there with you and I find it fascinating that he's the one right there and it says and he sat on the stone <laughs> he sat on it he's just waiting our God he's just waiting let's see how this turns out we know how it's going to turn out I don't know it's I, I was just so taken back by that. I, maybe you've seen that before. How many of you have seen that before like that? Okay, yeah, okay. And, and you've seen that the, the angel of the Lord is the Lord himself. Okay. He's always with us, but he's, he's at these special, special times. 
And there he is. And his countenance, verse 3, his countenance was like lightning and his raiment as white as snow. Now a couple more verses for you to look up if you wanted to study this out a bit. Um, you go to Daniel chapter 10. And Daniel was praying for a couple weeks. And the answer came by way of this individual and said that first, at the very first you were heard and your prayer was answered, but there was some uh, uh, interruptions and such that he had to deal with. And you compare that individual and, and the description of that individual with Revelation chapter 1 is a description of the Lord Jesus in his glory and such. And you'll see that there's a lot of things that look the same in there. His countenance was like lightning. This is God Almighty right there. We're going to stop right there. I want you to think about the uh, um, importance of this and the application of this. And God Almighty, not sitting on you as a stone, but living right in your heart. You think about that. How should that affect you? How does that affect you? How does that change your life? God Almighty, this one right there, he's right here. We have to stop. Our time's gone. We'll pick this up next week, Lord willing. Okay? Thank you. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we just thank you for your grace. Thank you for this time, uh, Lord, to look at your word. We thank you for your word. And let your word be our absolute final authority on everything, Lord. And uh, we just thank you for it. And we just thank you for all things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you, folks. And take care. Lord bless you. And we'll see you next week, hopefully. Lord willing. There you go.